to show up and to, you know, really be exposed to communities that you're not necessarily either a part of or you don't really have, are familiar with or, you know, understand. And um, that's, you know, how we start kind of breaking down barriers in a lot of ways. Yeah, so for sure. um, showing up to festivals that, you know, you're, uh, you've never been to, um, you know, showing up to different events and uh, just being a part of it is yeah. such a, it makes, it makes such a difference. And it really does help with you understanding. And that's kind of where we start. All right. Hey, everybody. How you doing out there? Awesome. Welcome to the Big Ideas Raleigh podcast. I'm your host, Dan Bagley, and we have a special podcast today because we're recording at the inaugural Engage Raleigh Community and Neighborhoods Expo in the McKimmon Center on North Carolina State campus. And wow, you guys are awesome. I can already feel the electricity in this room. For our listeners at home, we have a crowd of about 200 people in front of us. So make a little noise for everybody at home listening. These are our community champions joining us today. Thank you all for being here in this room with us. And of course, a big hello to our podcast listeners near and far, as we're honored that you're a part of the Big Idea Raleigh community too. Today, we're talking about something extremely important to citizens and cities, collaboration. Whether you're a local leader, a community champion, we all know that when we work together, we're planting seeds for a stronger, more connected Raleigh. And joining me is one of the podcast producers, Dr. Sarah Glova, longtime resident and local business owner and an expert in community building. How are we doing, Sarah? I'm doing so great, Dan. I've got three things up here with me. One, the mayor mentioned when she shared some opening remarks that this is an exciting expo because it's the first of its kind. And I hope that in years future, we have just as big of an audience, but there will only ever be one audience that was the first audience, and that's that's y'all. So that's really exciting. That's right. Two, I've got my favorite co-host up here with me, Dan. I'm so excited to be joining you. And then three, this amazing panel. I cannot wait to hear from these experts on collaboration. You said it right. So let's get this conversation going then, because today's uh, discussion is all about how we can cultivate stronger partnerships and engagement right here in Raleigh. So with us, we have... Dr. Ajamu Dillahunt Holloway, Assistant Professor of American History and Public History at NC State University. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ileana Santilla, Executive Director of El Pueblo. El Pueblo, excuse me. Welcome. Thank you. Corey Hennessy, Executive Director at the LGBT Center in Raleigh. Welcome. And of course, Taisha Mosley, Community Engagement Manor for the City of Raleigh. Thank you all. All right, we're going to have a little fun. We like to start these podcasts with a little bit of a game. So here's what we're going to do. It's a little bit different because it's usually panelists versus Sarah. But since we have 200 people in here, it's going to be panelists versus the citizens. And we're going to play a game called Two Facts and a false. So here's how it works. I'm gonna give you three facts. You have to decide which one is false, all right? And then Sarah is gonna be the judge. Is everybody ready? Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Mm-hmm. The topic is collaboration. Number one, collaboration fosters a sense of shared ownership of goals. Number two, col- collaboration can reduce burnout by distributing workload. Or number three, collaboration is always faster than working individually. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I I think we should let the audience here say which one they think is a false. So uh, let's hear any claps for number one being the false. Crickets. All right. What about number two? Nothing. A couple people heard a little bit. What about number three? Anyone feel like that was the false? (laughs) Okay, all right, all right. Well, panelists, which one do you think it is? And you can confer if you'd like. I'm gonna go with the audience. You go with the audience? Yeah. Go with the people. Yeah. The people? Yeah. You guys would be very wise. That is correct. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone. Collaboration isn't always faster. It can be longer due to the need for communication, consensus, and coordination among team members. But give you guys a round of applause because you're really smart in this room. 
Well, now what we'd like to do is kind of get the program kicked off and ask you guys your first question. And uh, again, thank you all for being here so much. Uh, you're all experts in your, your areas. What we want to start about with collaboration is a question on barriers. What is the largest barrier to collaboration between community and government? And Dr. John, let's start with you. Yeah, I think the, the biggest uh, barrier, uh, and not to uh, take up the traditional role, I am the historian, so I am gonna refer to, to a little history, is that uh, truthfully government uh, in many aspects have been, has been crafted and has been developed in a way that has excluded a, a large number of, of people uh, and a large number uh, of our population here within the city or within the country uh, on a larger scale or even looking at the statewide level. And so a large barrier is that uh, when we think about decision making, when we think about the world, when we think about governance, uh, it's through a lens that um, at its origins had um, uh, some issues, not some, maybe a lot of issues. Uh, and so the, the question uh, that we, we, have to, we have to deal with, that we have to ask ourselves is that, how do we interrogate that system to the highest scale uh, and remove all of uh, the negative elements that exist there uh, so that we can actually have uh, a true, uh, true nature of collaboration? And so I think the, the uh, solution, uh, the, uh, the area in which we, we have to focus on is uh, a deep investigation. Uh, and then action towards uh, our findings. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, you say a deep investigation. What what to you does that deep investigation look like? Mm -hmm. What what is that? You know, do you just all meet up in a room and like, hey, what do we do? Or what? Can you t explain that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think you you pull a, a, a diverse group of people together uh, to look at uh, the origins of uh, a governing system or a city or uh, a country, uh, and you look at uh, the wrongdoings that existed there, and you you ask yourself, okay, this existed. Uh, at present, uh, it was exclusionary in origin. And if we're practicing today, how can we uh, come together in the present uh, and look at how we can keep uh, the functioning of something, uh, but make it so that uh, it can function at the highest stage that removes those barriers? So it, I think it looks at uh, not just acknowledging the past, but uh, understanding it. Uh, that's what I, I tell my students uh, in the classroom that, you know, we're not here just to, uh, to know what happened, but how it happened. You yeah, know, that's great. Uh, so you don't repeat the same mistakes. Right, right, right. That's great. That's great. Um, thank you for sharing that. So uh, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask what you guys think some other strategies you think could help break through some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. So Ileana, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, for sure. I think for us, one of the biggest barriers is trust, right? So I think, you know, we live in a time right now where immigrants are painted in such a horrible negative light, right? So um, how can we trust governmental entities when the message that they're sending is that they want us out of this country, right? Currently, we're um, going to see House Bill HB 10, which enforces ICE collaboration with local law enforcement. My background is in education, right? So I've been in buses where kids look at police officers and they're like, duck, immigration's coming. They're taking you, they're taking your parents. So I think for us, it's like, how can we collaborate with government entities when that is the message that we're hearing, right? Mm -hmm. And for us, I think um, a good example of how it can work, it's communication, right? Uh, currently with the city of Raleigh, um, El Pueblo, uh, has a faith action ID program. So because undocumented people cannot have access to a government issued ID, um, we have the faith action ID and that's because of a collaboration with the Raleigh Police Department, the Wake County Public School Systems and several um, health entities. So I think that it is possible. However, we are facing many, many challenges in the current state that we're in. So what is, the, what is this ID you were just talking about? So it's a community action ID program. Community so, action, okay. um, yeah, and I mean, for us, it's like when you think about an ID, um, you know, parents need that when they enroll their students in schools. We have a lot of teachers who are like, oh, you know, the Latino parents, sometimes they don't care. And it's not that they don't care. It's that they can't even volunteer because they don't have a government issued ID. Yeah. So with this ID program, they can volunteer. They can, you know, when they're driving, think about driving to the doctor and worried, worrying about if you're going to get pulled over and get a ticket. Now with House Bill HB 10, if you're going to be taken away from your family. So I think that for us, even though it's a simple ID and it o it's only good for a year, it provides community members an opportunity to drive without fear, to pick up their children from school, to volunteer, to get vaccinated. So I think that for us, it's a huge win, but we've been working on that initiative for several years. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Corey, if you'd like to add to that at all. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I would agree with the the lack of trust. And I think that there's, um, you know, a number of things that we see uh, talking about immigrants, talking about just uh, historically left out populations. Um, you know, for the LGBTQ plus community, we are seeing anti legislation on all levels. And so that's something that, you know, we continuously have to find ways to fight. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we, you know, don't really necessarily see is that like connection or that collaboration with those government entities. You know, they there's oftentimes, you know, public hearings and different things that we, you know, are invited to um, from different folks. But we don't necessarily see the actions um, behind that all the time. Um, you know, I know, for example, the non-discrimination ordinances, there's, it's great that there's so many communities, cities, counties, et cetera, that um, have adopted these over the last couple of years. But most of us don't really understand exactly what that means and what actions are being taken to provide protections to different communities that are kind of covered under those non-discrimination ordinances. So, you know, I think that uh, there's there's a lot of room to, to, you know, increase and improve some of those things. And there's a lot of communities that are already doing the work. And so that collaboration piece is such a big right, thing right. that, you know, um, I'm really excited that this is what we're talking about. Wonderful. Thank you for that so much. Yeah. These are such beautiful examples that we're hearing already. And a theme that's starting to emerge for me is we're hearing examples of things that are happening, maybe things that have been, Eliana, you mentioned years in, in the making. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about how you're talking with your students, Professor, about ways that things right. can change. So we're hearing about progress, but we're also hearing that there's a lot of ways, I'm going to use your words, Corey, to increase and improve. Um, so it's this tension of there are things that are happening and there's more that, that needs to be done. So this is a really interesting theme that's emerging. Yeah, that's a great point. And Taisha, I want to give you the opportunity as well because you come from a different perspective, you know, working for the city, you know, uh, how do you feel about, you know, these barriers and, and uh, breaking through those with yeah, collaboration? I mean, I would just add that um, relationships is just the key to it all. Yeah. Um, relationships is often the biggest barrier that we have or lack thereof. Um, I, something else that I've seen just in, in my time in, in this work or just as a resident of, of this city for um, a while, I would say it's just also the, the, the lack of awareness. I think sometimes when people think of government, you think of like the government has a mayor and they have kind folks that pick up my trash once a week, right? But there's so much more that government does. And I think sometimes when people are made aware that we have an office of sustainability, um, that we have an engagement van that'll come to your neighborhood and tell you anything or bring any information that you like to learn, those types of things not only um, bring more awareness, but they help to build those relationships. Has anybody seen the community engagement van? Anybody oh. seen it? Drive around? I've been seeing it when I drive around. That's I'm excited. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Solar panels and everything. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, that's a wonderful lead-in. Uh, one thing I, I do, people don't know what they don't know and what the city does. I would like to take a few minutes and actually give everyone an opportunity to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. And if you have a big ideas that you're kind of working on right now, what would that big idea be? And you know what? We're, we're going to start on the other end this oh, time. Oh, man. It came Taisha, back this way so We're going to go that way. That's right. Um. <laughs> I'm Taisha, uh, native of Raleigh, uh, fourth, fifth generation native of Raleigh. Um, I have a, I think something really cool is that my office is located right, right next door to my grandma's house. So sometimes <laughs> on my lunch break, um, I go have lunch at my grandmother's. Um, uh, I am blessed to be a part of the Office of Community Engagement, and and I think one of the the big ideas is you all being here today. Uh, <laughs> this is, as we said, yeah. one of our very first, our very first um, expo, and this was just a wild idea that um, the team came up with. Shout out to Lance over there. I won't embarrass him, but this is really his brainchild. <laughs> um, Yay, Lance! And it, it, it really went from a, I had a much smaller idea. I was like, oh, we'll have a couple of departments. And Lance said, go bigger. Um, <laughs> so today is, is that big idea for, for the Office of Engagement and also our Housing and Neighborhoods team. Thank you. Thank you. Corey. Go, oh, man. Um, I'm Corey. Um, I, yeah, again, I'm the executive director at the LGBT Center of Raleigh. Um, I've only been the executive director for a little over a year now officially, um, but I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, with the organization for over seven years. Um, and I've been in Raleigh for 
13, 14 years. Um, so not originally from here, but I definitely consider this to be home. And, uh, you know, something that we do that, you know, I think a lot of folks don't necessarily that we do is uh, we're a community center first. Uh, we provide a lot of programs and services to LGBTQ plus folks um, and their allies. Uh, we pro provide a lot of education opportunities because that's something that, you know, we're seeing is popping up because of all the anti-legislation um, that people just don't understand, don't understand, you know, identities, don't understand, you know, terminology, just don't understand that th our lives. And yeah, so we, we, we do a lot in the community. Um, we are working on uh, renovating a new space that will be back downtown and trying to um, save an old building in, in oh, Raleigh. Cool. And we're really yeah. excited and happy about that. And please come and talk to me. I'll be glad to talk about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably the big, maybe not necessarily a big idea, but a big, a big project. That's that a big event, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, because we, we re you know, recognize that we need to be more accessible to the community. Um, we Absolutely. have a lot of unhoused folks that we work with, um, you know, a lot of folks that really just need the extra support and extra community. That's great. And before we jump to Ileana, I was just curious, you talked about the community center as a community center, which is wonderful. I used to be a community center director, so I, I'm just thinking about all the people that come in. Do, how many people do you think come in a, a month just to be seen, to be heard? Yeah, I, well, so I guess, you know, pre-pandemic, um, we were uh, in a space that was just across from the bus station downtown. And I think we had, you know, probably 50 or so people come through, um, you know, in at different times. Yeah. I would say, you know, maybe more than that in different weeks. You know, now we are kind of in a space that's not necessarily accessible. It's not downtown. So we're seeing less of that, but we still have, we still see the need via like sure. social media outreach mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people reaching out to our support services specialist and, um, mm. you know, people that are continuously moving to Raleigh, making sure that this is a safe and affirming space. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Ileana, please. Well, my name is Ileana Santillan. I'm the executive director of El Pueblo. I've been executive director for three years. Um, my background is actually in education. So I started out as a teacher. I taught English as a second language for 10 years in oh, wow. Sanford, Lee County, and then somehow ended up here in Wake County. <laughs> and then I've been doing movie, movement work uh, for about 10 years. And El Pueblo is an organization that's been around for 29 years. We're getting ready to celebrate our 30th Fiesta del Pueblo, which is a big idea. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Yeah, it's... It's, we're super excited. It's next Sunday, so I hope to see y'all there. And um, El Pueblo's known for, for this party, right? So it's Fayetteville Street. We shut it down. It's, you know, the heart of North Carolina, the heart of Raleigh. So for us to be there, like to just exist there on that day is huge. But also uh, we're launching our voter guide. So we have a Spanish voter guide that we've been working on for several years now. And um, this voter guide, we hope that um, it encourages people to educate themselves before they vote, right? We're seeing a lot of the issues that we're seeing because the elected officials officials that we currently have don't listen to us or don't agree with us. So our goal is to make sure that Spanish speakers, English, everyone has access to the information that they need to um, cast their ballot this November. And hopefully we'll be able to see some positive changes, not just in Raleigh, but in our entire state. And That's I love cool. that you brought that and did a bit of show and tell and kind of showed it to our audience. For our folks who are just listening and maybe not watching on YouTube, can you tell us where this is going to be accessible? Where can yeah. people find this? Yes. So we have a website called votemosnc.com and it's bilingual so y'all can access it. Um, you can put your address, your your ballot will come up and you, you can make sure that you, uh, you know, see the different issues that the candidates talk about. That is wonderful. Thank you. And it's really, it looks good too. It's so colorful. Yeah. You can't miss yeah. it. <laughs> wonderful. Ajamu, please, same thing. Yeah, so first let me say it's an honor to be on a panel with such amazing people who are doing such great work for our communities, for our city, uh, and really yes, for our country. So uh, it's, it's an honor to be on this panel. But uh, my name is Ajamu. Uh, I teach African-American history and public history at NC State, born and raised here in Raleigh, uh, graduate of Southeast Raleigh High School, uh, and a bulldog <laughs> pride, you know, some bulldogs bulldog in pride. here, I know, I know. Um, and also a graduate of North Carolina Central University. Uh, the number Eagles. one historically black college in the country. And oh, I'm it, seeing it, lots of snaps in the audience. All right, all right, all right. There. All right. <laughs> and um, there I studied um, history and political science, and there my, my worldview uh, was really transformed. Growing up, my, uh, mm. uh, my, my 
grandparents, uh, my grandmother was the local president of uh, the, the North Carolina Associ Association of Educators, uh, the Wake County wow. uh, branch, and my grandfather was the president of the local American Postal Workers Union. Uh, he's a retired postal worker. Uh, and so my dad uh, grew up uh, in Chavis, uh, Chavis Heights. My mom, parents went to Enloe High School. So Raleigh uh, is uh, deep, in, deep in my blood and I'm really grateful for it. I care about it. Uh, and when I went to Michigan State, uh, to study for my PhD in history, the number one goal was to get back to Raleigh to see how I can uh, use my degree to help uh, make it a better place and uh, help uh, improve and strengthen, strengthen my community. So the job at NC State opened up, I applied and um, I got hired. And so on a day to day, I'm able to teach uh, not just history majors, but uh, future engineers, uh, future educators uh, here at NC State. And we have a fantastic graduate program in public history uh, where we uh, look at how the public interacts uh, with the past. So from historic sites, museums, to governing, to a whole host of things, uh, we do that. And we have students working uh, for different parts of the city, different historical organizations, uh, different uh, social justice organizations too. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a joy. And I'm also a part of a, a group called uh, Refund Raleigh. And you know, our, our big idea, or I think the big idea uh, with Refund Raleigh and uh, my role as a professor is, how do we use history to inspire how do we use history to guide? Uh, those who conceptualize what African-American history was said it's not just understanding the black experience in its totality, but African-American history is about changing the world. Uh, African-American history is about making the world a better place. And so I take that very serious. Uh, and at Reef and Raleigh, we also take that very serious. And our uh, big project, what I think a lot of us here are trying to do is, how do we get people uh, to be active participants in making their communities better, making their uh, communities safer? And how do we, uh, how do we build uh, energy, uh, build, build a strong movement uh, to ensure that our communities have what they need to thrive and that democracy is achieved at its highest stage. I love that. Wow. I love that. Wow, love Professor. That. And I'm sorry, can you say one more time where you currently teach, just so I make sure I... <laughs> I teach at North Carolina State at University. At North Carolina State which, University, okay. Just the, checking, just checking. You know, the school that, you know, had both, you know, women and men's basketball team in the Final Four. That you know, one, that school, school. Yeah. okay. Is that what that team, that's that team? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the team. Yeah, oh, okay. just, just, just so we're clear, you know, there's a lot of wolf pack in here. Th and welcome to our campus. <laughs> I just, I just, any, any corn huskers, Nebraska? <laughs> hey, we got one. All right. Okay, it's my wife. But anyway. <laughs> so you, actually where you left off is where I want to pick up because you, you, you have a great, you, you kind of proposed a great question. And, and that's, you know, in everyone, what's your opinion on what anyone listening can do to get involved mm. with their community today? You know, you were just talking about it. it's so important to get involved. And I, I open it up. Who wants to take that first? I mean, I can. Yes, I can. let's do it. <laughs> Come to our festival <laughs> next <laughs> Sunday. But, like, I mean, I, I mean it in, like, a real way. Like, I think for people to get, like, involved with our community, like, you have to put yourself out there, right? So I think that there's plenty of opportunities, um, you know, to, to get out there and not just, like, get to know our communities and, like, be with them and vibe with them, but also, like, support us, right? We have HB10, House Bill HB10 coming up next week. Call your legislators. Tell them that this bill will not um, allow for co collaboration between community members. And, like, I mean, when you think about, you know, like, like children, right? And I go back to my... My educational background. When I left the, class, the classroom, my kids were like, why are you doing this? Like, we, we're going to be good. We'll get better grades. But it was like, oh. you know, like, I want to do more for them out here. And I feel like I'm doing that, right? So I feel like there are plenty of ways where you can get, um, you know, involved. This November, please look at your candidates, local, mm. statewide, sure. federal. Make sure that you're voting for people who support what you want to see, what to, that, that, want, that want the same things that you want to see. So just, to, just real quickly, one of the things you said, which seems so simple, is just call your legislator. You know, but what, what does that take to do? And, and if you do call, what does that, what is that process? What does it feel like? Because some people are get very intimidated calling other people. I mean, is it a simple process? It's super simple. You just look them up and I, I get this question all the time. So it's intimidating and the people are like, does it really make a difference? Everything that you do make a difference. Even if you leave a voicemail, they'll tell you and be like, oh, you know, five people called and they said that they don't agree with this bill or 10 people. So I think anything that you do matters. You can call them, you can email them, you can go to the General Assembly on Wednesday and hang out with us. We'll, we'll definitely be 
be there. But I think there's so much that you can do and everything that you do matters. That's so helpful because I think, you know, I'm I'm in the elder millennial category. I don't know if I have any other elder millennials. Okay. So we're a little bit afraid of the phone. Like I get nervous calling to order a pizza sometimes, right? <laughs> but this idea that I really can pick up the phone. I don't have to have a polished speech. I don't need to have credentials. I really can look up the representatives um, who represent the area where I live and I can say, hey, I heard about this. Here's how I feel about it. Really, that's enough. Right. That's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll I'll try to just touch three ways. Um, there are tons of ways for you to get involved with the city. Um, we're always looking for people to join one of our many boards or commissions. Oh, yeah. Um, you can go to the city's website. I think we may have some stuff at our table today to show you some of the openings that are available on those boards or commissions. Um, the Housing and Neighborhoods Department mm -hmm. has several different citizen academies that you can participate in to learn about city government, city departments. Um, and then Office of Community Engagement recently launched what we call the Engagement Network. And that is available to grassroots, um, community groups, small organizations where you can, once you're approved to be a part of the network, you can obtain um, free meeting space at some of our community centers. Um, we offer capacity building. We'll help you get newsletters out to help you grow. We also give you access, priority access to our community engagement van if you are a part of our engagement network. Um, and that is only a couple of months old now, so it's, it's new. And a lot of people may not know about it, but if you search engagement network on the city's website or come find me or one of the folks in these cool <laughs> light blue shirts, um, we can get you more information about that. And the Academy, I heard that mentioned. If you're enjoying this podcast episode, check out one of our recent episodes. We talked about that. We did. We talked about the, uh, the Raleigh uh, Citizens uh, Academy and the uh, neighborhood... Citizens Leadership Academy and the Raleigh Neighborhood College, excuse yeah. me. Uh, yeah, and it's a great episode. Uh, uh, Dr. Luis Oliveri, uh, Robert talked about that. And uh, yeah, go check out that podcast. Thanks for, for reminding us. And, and then you talked about this van. What, what is this van? Yeah, what, it's, it's, it's really simple. Um, it's, it's our way of meeting people where they are. So we, we want to up in the expectation that everybody has time or interest of coming downtown to City Hall to find something out, or um, it's really us trying to re-engage with people face-to-face post-pandemic um, to make sure that we're having interactions with people. So what it is, it's, it's right in the temporary van that we have. Um, you can re request it and you can tell us, like, you know, our neighborhood is interested in learning about um, solid waste services. And we'll partner with the solid waste services department. We'll come out to your neighborhood. We have music. We have a cool tent. Uh, and we just really have conversations and we bring the information to you. Um, and we can come to your community event, your neighborhood block party. We will come to a birthday party if you give us cupcakes, whatever. <laughs> we just really want to meet people where they are. Um, in the new year, we're going to have a new solar power Ooh, vehicle that's what? coming. Yeah. Um, and right now we have a survey online asking for your input on the artwork. So we've had several local artists give us mock-ups and we're asking for input on um, the art that should go on our permanent van. And the van, Thank I you. think it just speaks to your... Uh, perspective on engagement. One of the first times I heard you speak, Taisha, you talked about engagement. It changed the way I thought about the word engagement. I think that I had the misconception that we're engaging others when we let them know about opportunities. You can almost picture like a right. megaphone, right? And that's amplification. That's not engagement. Right. And you talked about engagement as going to where people are. So not asking them to come to us, but going to where they are. And so mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I'm hearing correctly. If my neighborhood is doing anything and we especially a birthday party especially a birthday party with cupcakes. <laughs> with cupcakes and we want information on something it doesn't have to be information on your office it doesn't have to be from the office of community engagement it could be sustainability it could be solid waste services my kids want to know what happens when we flush and you say you know what ask for the community engagement van and we'll come to your neighborhood that's exactly. what i'm saying exactly wow. it's very much like the ice cream trucks that used to come to your neighborhood <laughs> right that's where it came from and you would hear that music and then you knew ice cream was coming that's what we do. And sometimes we do have ice cream, but um, <laughs> that's what we do. We'll and it's bring not just information. neighborhoods, associations, yep. neighborhood or associations. You don't have to be a 501c3. You don't have to be a neighborhood. You could be a community group. Um, we can meet you where you are. So please, please, it's called, you can just search community engagement van. 
Great, so um, it's online. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and Corey, we want to give you the same opportunity, you know, uh, one, one way people can get involved. Well, first of all, um, I voted on the art for the van. <laughs> hey, all right. Um, there's some really cool ones, so y'all should definitely do that. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's just kind of an extension of what, you know, other folks have said is that just showing up first and foremost, you know, unfortunately, you know, not everybody has the same viewpoints and the same beliefs and, you know, different things, but we all live here, right? We are all a part of this community. We're all citizens of, you know, the the Raleigh Triangle Central North Carolina area, right? So to show up and to, you know, really be exposed to communities that you're not necessarily either a part of or you don't really have, are familiar with or, you know, understand, um, that's, you know, how we start kind of breaking down barriers in a lot of ways. Yeah, so for sure. um, showing up to festivals that, you know, you're, uh, you've never been to, um, you know, showing up to different events and uh, just being a part of it is yeah. such a, it makes, it makes such a difference and it really mm -hmm. does help with you understanding and that's kind of where we start. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Just simple as showing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ajama, I want to give you the same opportunity. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think getting involved, uh, what uh, has, has been mentioned, so I don't have uh, too much to add, but, you know, uh, we all see things in the world. We see issues. We see problems that we want to get involved with. And sometimes we, we're said to uh, look at it as an individual, you know, like, you know, you, can, you, you yourself, you know, by yourself can create change. But I encourage people uh, to take that individual drive for change or to improve something uh, and meet with a couple of people. Find a like-minded organization uh, and get involved. Engage in, you know, council meetings. Engage in uh, uh, meetings of the school board, of the county commissioner, or uh, you name it. You know, just, you know, find a way to get involved. But uh, don't think that, you know, by yourself you can do it. Do it in community, in collaboration uh, mm -hmm. with people because uh, that's where real change can happen. That's where, where the power is. Yeah, You're right. There's that You're word, collaboration. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure... You're probably getting a little tired of hearing me ask questions. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to come to you. So Sarah is going to go get a mic from good old Luke over there. <laughs> and right now you have a moment to think about a question you would like to ask the panel or an individual on the panel. So all you have to do is raise your hand. And I have to warn you, we don't have a ton of time. We have time for a couple questions. So Sarah, take it away. One brave soul. Get my right steps in, the middle. Get my right steps in, the middle. in y'all. <laughs> All right. Do you mind telling us your name and what you do? What keeps you busy in Raleigh? Hello. Uh, I'm Stephen Walker. I work for Urban One. Um, I'm the chief marketing evangelist uh, for our company. Um, and by way of marketing, I was thinking for each one of you, for us to uh, collaborate and engage with you individually, what one thing would the people in this room, if you could tell us one thing that we could communicate I'm sorry, contact you about to build some collaboration. What would be that one thing for each one of you? Marketing evangelists for real. That's a great <laughs> question. It. Really cool title too. Um, for, for us in the Office of Community Engagement, um, it would just be great if you could reach out to um, anyone on our team, myself, Lance, and we just set up some time, maybe just 30 minutes to chat about what you do, kind of what your goals are, and we can find some synergies that may exist with the work that we have going on. We do that type of brainstorming all the time. So I have my business cards in my pocket. Again, anybody with this cool shirt on, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can set up some time and chat. Any of the panelists? All right, let's take our next question. Who's Gavin? There we go. Oh, I see one over here. I'm Two brave here. souls. I love it. <laughs> You mind telling us who you are? Hi, my name is Michael Tomzak. I'm a junior at Broughton High School. And my question is, what do you guys have in the way of direct in youth engagement with high school students, with teens, with middle and elementary school students? What can you guys do to directly impact the next generation and our future? What a great question. Such a good question. Yeah, round of applause for the junior at Broughton High School here for a great question. Well, something that we have, that we've had basically before the center was kind of a brick and mortar space um, is we have a ton of youth programs and the ways that youth get engaged. Um, we typically have a lot of high school students, but uh, we do have a youth leadership team. We have, um, you know, it's an opportunity where 
uh, youth can apply to be on our youth leadership team, um, and they have opportunities to, to do some planning and actually engagement with um, other youth in their communities. We help them build skills uh, to take to their high schools, to you know their communities. Um, we also have a youth leadership camp, which is kind of in a little bit of extension of that, but um, it is a, is an overnight camp. We are actually bringing it back this year. Really excited Love about it. it. Um, and uh, again, it's just a it's another way for youth to um, really just feel empowered and build those skills to to work within their communities. Um, you know, something that we often uh, we. we have previously um, engaged with this uh, some of the the school's GSAs um, or uh, the uh, Gay Straight Alliance um, LGBTQ clubs in schools. Um, it's been a little bit more challenging with um, the, the Parents' Bill of, of Rights within schools, um, but we're still trying to find ways to make sure that that youth uh, know about us and um, use us as a resource, and then help them, you know, be able to take some of that back to their communities. Yeah, and I would just add that at the city, we have several youth programs through summer youth employment, oftentimes have internships, um, pathways to public service is another opportunity. Most of our boards and commissions have seats set aside specifically for youth. Um, so there's, there's an opportunity there. And I'm sure I'm missing something. Raleigh Parks has tons of opportunities for youth as well. Go ahead. And at Little Pueblo, we have um, an internship program that we launched a couple years ago. So we work with students from all campuses, um, community colleges, and they have an opportunity to like work within the organization in different departments, like communication and several communications and several others. Last year, um, three of our interns became staff. So we have a real like true leadership pipeline where they become staff. And one of um, our communications um, folks, um, his name is Luis. He wants to be a teacher. He has a year left in school. He's actually at NC State, and I just know that he's going to be the best teacher no matter what subject he teaches because in everything that he does he's going to make sure that students are advocating for the communities that they work with so um next year we'll launch we're launching our high school program we kind of took a step back because of the pandemic um we acknowledge that young people's everyone's mental health you know took a toll so we're revamping our um, high school program to make sure that it meets the needs uh, the current needs of young folks that's wonderful one you're a junior at Broughton. I hope you're applying to NC State. We'd love to have you. I hope to see you in my class. <laughs> so that's one way. And, and at NC State, we're going to do great things. So I'll, I'll be looking for you in about two years. Um, but uh, with Reef from Raleigh, we have an ambassador program uh, where we do stuff, you know, around community safety. Uh, we also have relationships. Uh, when I was in high school at, at Southeast Raleigh, uh, we were uh, pushing uh, for more peer mediation, restorative justice, conflict resolution, how to really get down to the grassroots of the problem in, you know, what, what many have called the school to prison pipeline. And so uh, we, mm. you know, have relationships with groups like Education Justice Alliance who are doing really, really good things among students and parents, uh, empowering them to, to, to take control of their education and uh, make it fair and just and bring forward uh, some solutions uh, that are rooted in uh, students and family and community. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Sarah, I believe the mayor has something to add to this. Yeah, I'm gonna pass the mic to the mayor, which I had to say out loud because I don't get to say that very often. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Great question. And one of the challenges we face, we have all of these youth programs, but they're all over the place. And we recently started a uh, mayor's um, committee, our task force on youth affairs. First recommendation was to create a Department of Youth Affairs. We're working on that now. So we know yeah, people definitely. know where to go. It's kind of like community engagement. You know, we didn't have a community engagement department. We do now, and look at what we're doing. We didn't have a DEI department before. We have one now. Look at what we're doing. So I can only imagine that this will really elevate participation in our youth programs, whether it be parks and recreation, um, the police department, or boards and commissions, but that will be a way to access that. And I just want to tell you, really appreciate you being here and standing up and asking that question. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. And Dan, we had one more quick audience shout out for a program that's going on. My name is Lynn Hebel, and I started the Hollows Community Garden about four years ago only because of Dan and Taisha. So the city has uh, 
found a grant to make the Hollows Community Garden happen. And giving back to youth is not stated in our mission, but it is really one of our biggest purposes of being there and existing in the first place. So this is a great opportunity. Thank you guys for letting me share this. But we would like to pursue, and through the mayor's great idea, we will be able to pursue and let high school students know that we exist, that on Sunday they can go to Eastgate Park and help out and learn about sustainability and growing, where food comes from. It's, it's huge for high school students. And, and we're also partnering with 4-H for education. So monthly we'll have that. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah thanks. That's, that's great. And to, kind of to your point, uh, John, it sounds like there's education everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to find it. And uh, to the mayor's point, you know, having a, uh, a youth affairs group where it's all in one spot, that's a great idea. So yeah. one vote. Dan, we have other questions on the audience, but do we have time or do we need to direct folks? One more. One more we question. have time for one more. All right. I see a hand back here, and I think it's somebody I recognize. Let me go back here and see. Is that Dr. Ulysses Lane back here? Dr. <laughs> Lane. <laughs> Dr. Lane, what's your question? Well, for those who might not know Dr. Lane, do you mind introducing yourself briefly? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Ulysses Lane. I'm involved with a lot of stuff with the Citizen Advisory Board. I'm chair of the Southeast Citizen Advisory Council, and I do a lot of other uh, networking with community and, and other leaders. But I did want to ask this question about networking because a little bit what uh, Taisha mentioned about the network uh, that they have up and how we can get a little, I've seen a lot of questions about with the private sector and with the city, how we can go to find a list of these organizations and groups so that we can partner with and you talked about registering some of them, but also the ones that are non-registered because there are some programs. So can you talk a little bit about that networking that you're going to do? And is there a list that we can go to for some topic that deals with housing or deals with uh, um, homelessness or whatever? And we can pull those up and we can start networking with them right away. Yes, Dr. Lane is also a proud graduate of North Carolina a and State University. Aggie pride <laughs> to all my Aggies in the room. Um, yes, Dr. Lane, in the engagement network, um, it also has the option to search for organizations based off of different categories or topics. It has the option to look for organizations based off of their location. Now, this is only the organizations that have registered so far. So as more organizations register, you'll see more topic and categories. You'll see more locations across the city for the opportunity to partnership. And that was something that was really important to us as we were developing it. We didn't just want to have like an Excel spreadsheet that sat on our computers. <laughs> we wanted to make something available for city department so that when they're having an event, in Southeast Raleigh, because that's my favorite part of town, um, they could go yeah. and um, look for organizations on the South Side. Or um, like you said, Dr. Lane, uh, if, if community groups or just individuals want to know who does youth services in my area, there's the opportunity on that engagement network for them to search by location as well. Yeah. Again, it's new. So if you go up there and you're like, they only have 52 Y'all go sign up so we can get to 1,002. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's a good call to action. And we can make sure, as we do with each podcast episode, when the episode comes out, we include what are called show notes. Do I have any podcast fans in here? Anybody listen to podcasts? Oh, we yeah. got some. All so right. So y'all know about <laughs> show you. notes. So in the show notes, we're going to include links to so many of the resources that have been mentioned today. So if you heard about something that you would like to check out, we'll do our homework and we'll make sure that all those links go in those show notes. Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning that, Sarah. Well, we are starting to get a little low on time, so I did want to ask uh, one more question uh, before we go, and it's how can we strategically reach audiences in underrepresented areas? Uh, Ajamo, you were talking about that a little bit, you know, and I think actually we all were. I think, Corey, you were as well. Actually, everyone was. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the best way for us to reach, mm -hmm. especially as a, as a city? How should we be doing it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know... Um, I think what Taisha and her team has uh, been doing uh, has been fantastic. I didn't mention, but uh, we had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with them and other community groups around the alternative response model and uh, oh. to, to see um, how uh, her team uh, was going beyond, you know, just uh, 
what the plan was. It was like, okay, there's a need here. We're going to assess. We need to be here. We need to be there. Uh, I, think, um, I, think, uh, I think that's important. I think getting creative in terms of how you engage. But also there, there, there are people who uh, are engaging uh, who uh, might not be listened to or heard of. And so when we begin to look at structural elements to have people be able to engage in governing in a really serious, really meaningful manner, uh, that'll open the doors because the question of trust uh, is real. And so yeah, uh, from the point. city level, uh, you are kind of uh, working at a, at a disadvantage uh, almost, but uh, it's a disadvantage that I think can be overcome uh, with honesty, with truth, uh, and real, you know, real community, uh, community empowerment. So there are also intentional elements um, here at NC State, just because we're on campus, I have to shout out the Department of History. It's great. <laughs> uh, but there's even, you know, talks about what it looks like to have uh, a city historian. So we look at these issues, we look at these assessments, and not just uh, uh, a small group of people know what happened, but we all know what happened. We all know why, and we all come up with a collective solution uh, to move forward. So hopefully uh, we, we get a get an office of, of the historian, you know, uh, like in the it. city. I like uh, it. Many cities have it. But, you know, I, I think there are uh, very intentional ways, I think, uh, there are many elements of the city uh, who are leading uh, by example, uh, and you know there are more elements that could that could follow follow that lead. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there is so much history that we know has mm -hmm. been lost mm -hmm. that you don't know what you don't know until mm -hmm. little snippets pop up, that's and right. to be able to capture that is just so important. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks and for Dan, if that. I may, just yeah. just answer that question. Something not that I just encourage myself or my colleagues. But I encourage anyone that I that if you have any type of event, ask yourself three questions. Mm -hmm. Who are you trying to reach? Mm -hmm. How can you reach those individuals? Yeah. And where can you reach them? If you ask yourself those three questions every time before you have an event, you are more likely to not only reach the, that primary group of stakeholders, but the mm -hmm. secondary, the tertiary groups as well. Absolutely. And then when those people show up to your event or your neighborhood, I want you to just look around and ask yourself, well, who's not here? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we look and we say, oh, we have 200 people today, and I'm so glad you all came. <laughs> but in my mind, I'm like, okay, how many people do we have between the ages of 18 and 21? How many demographics do we have? And so that's something that I'm always encouraging the team to like look at the demographics. Not only who's showing up, but who's not showing up. So as a community, we ask ourselves those three questions, and then the fourth of, I did all that, now, who's not here? You keep doing that work and digging and digging to, to meet the groups that may not necessarily um, be a part of the events or the, or the, the different um, opportunities that you have for engagement. That's great. Who, how, and where. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Uh, Ileana Corey, uh, give you the same opportunity. Um, I can add real quick. I think for us, um, something that I see all the time is people wanting us in their spaces and they have interpretation. Great. Please have interpretation, but it takes more than that. Just mm -hmm. because you're saying something in Spanish and we understand it because of the interpretation equipment, it doesn't feel right. Like it still mm -hmm. doesn't feel homey. It doesn't have that sense of community. So allow yourself some space to really like get to know the people. Interpretation, again, great. If you're not doing it, please do it. And um, when you're trying to really, really build that trust that we're talking about, that community, make yourself, like put yourself out there. Talk to us like you, you know, you want to know about us. Go to yeah. Southeast Raleigh, sure. got, um, International Food. It's like, just enjoy um, what the city has to offer. And then again, you know, like really when you're bringing us into your communities, really make us feel welcome. Like treat, you know, talk to us. Like don't worry about the interpretation. We all hand, you know, you, everybody can like say hello, goodbye, whatever. Yeah. But really, um, you know, just a plug for interpretation and for that sense of like building community and genuine care. It's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Corey. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that they all said, we hit it. Yeah, a okay. lot. Um, I think, you know, just to kind of add is that um, it's about making sure that, one, you're reaching out first and you're just saying, let's have a conversation. Um, but also, you know, something that I think, you know, we experience often is everybody wants to talk to us during the month of June, just Pride Month, mm -hmm. and then, you know, not really the rest of the year. So, right. There's, um, there's 11 other months. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're, we do work all year round. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, I think that just kind of thinking of, you know, outside of that and, and recognizing, realizing kind of what I said before is that we're here. We live here. We're a part right. of this community. So um, reach out. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. I want to go back to Corey's words that I highlighted Please. at the beginning. Uh, when they said this idea of to increase and improve, there is a recognition of there's so much being done and that there's so much to increase and improve. And that's really felt like a theme today. I can tell you one thing right now. I am so proud to live in a city with the four of you. Dang wow. tootin'. That's right. Okay. I've never done this before. Uh-oh. We're going to try it this way. I'm going to give you each 20 seconds. 20 seconds to, if there's something we did not touch upon today that you really wanted to talk about and put out there on collaboration, on breaking through the barriers of collaboration, or if it's something else. But you got 20 seconds. Who's ready to go first? Do you want to start down there? Right, <laughs> Taisha, he's calling you out. So. Um, 20 seconds, something that we haven't talked about. I would just say um, it's important to, to give grace, to, here, to here. be re- receiving of grace. Remember that, you know, I work for the government, but I'm a person first. <laughs> um, be kind. And, and just let's, as a community, be better about reducing our assumptions and just asking the questions. Love it. Reducing the assumptions and asking the questions. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> that was great. That was wonderful. Um, you know, I think uh, I would just say, yeah, lead with compassion um, and go in with just open minds um, and open hearts and have a conversation, um, you know, and realize that, yeah, I don't know, yeah, <laughs> ditto, uh, we're all human. Um, you know, we we all have a lot different parts of our lives that we live. Um, and, you know, I think that if you're really taking the time to listen and learn and understand, there's so much growth that comes yeah. from that. Mm. Thank you, Ileana. And I would just say that we're all doing the very best we can oh. in the times that we're in. You know? True. So I think for us, like Alpo, but we often get calls and they're like, do you have a program for elementary school kids? Like, can you go and, you know, solve this issue with housing? And sometimes we can't do it. And it's not because we don't want to. It's because we don't have a capacity. So, you know, again, patience, like give us grace. We are all genuinely doing the very best that we can. And there's so much areas that we can improve upon. But we're, again, doing the very best we can. Thank you. And... Last. Yeah, I, I feel bad because I said let's start here, and I was hoping I would have something, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out my 20 seconds. But I'll, I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a try. Um, you know, I, I I agree with you know what is what has been said, uh, but you know um, another world uh, is possible. Uh, I believe we have to use good judgment to know when to push, uh, when you know to pull pack pull back, uh, when to rethink uh, our approach. Uh, but I think we have to. Uh, be bold. Uh, we have to uh, make sacrifices. Uh, we have to be, you know, willing uh, to build the world we want to see um, uh, and embrace change on all fronts. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. And can I just say, I would put a bumper sticker on my car that says Professor Dillahunt Holloway for City of Raleigh Historian. Anybody right. else? There it is. <laughs> there it is. It's been shouted out. Well, uh, with that, uh, Ajamu, Ileana, Corey, Taisha, Sarah, thank you so much. Let's give these guys a big round of applause. And thank you for listening to or watching this podcast. Give us a follow and find Big Ideas Raleigh Podcast on any podcast app or on YouTube. We've got more great episodes coming your way as we dive deep into the heartbeat of your Oak City. And hey, if you have any ideas for our podcasts, you know who you are. Visit our podcast page and learn how you can share your ideas with us. We'd love to hear from you. And a special shout out to the production team behind the podcast today, the City Rally Communications. Those guys over there, give them a shout out. Earfluence, a Raleigh-based podcast production company. Learn more at earfluence.com. And this podcast was brought to you by the City of Raleigh's Office of Strategy and Innovation, also known as the Office of Yes And, and the City of Raleigh's Communication Department. I'm Dan Bagley here with Dr. Sarah Glova, and we'll see you next time on the Big Ideas Raleigh podcast. Thank you. Great job.